And now let us praise the Fox News Channel. <laughs> We called a lot of your, uh, of a lot of Republicans today who are who are in who are in office at the moment. These are the ones who told us no. Senators Alexander, Barrasso, Cornyn, Crapo, Dement, Enzi, Grassley, Kyle, McC McConnell, uh, Sessions, Bacchus, Gregg, and Inhofe. No response from Bunning, Coburn, Ensign, Graham, Hatch, uh, and McCain. I'm not really surprised, but I, wh what is your take on why does no one wants to talk about this? Why does no one want to talk about this? All hail Shep Smith at Fox News, and I'm not kidding. Because Fox News is an outfit that can get return calls from Republican senators most of the time, unlike some other people I know who shall remain nameless, but who are me. Um, because Fox News can get callbacks from Republican senators, Shep Smith making a hullabaloo on his show about the Republicans who are not supporting health care for 9-11 first responders means that those Republicans might feel compelled to explain publicly why they don't support health care for 9-11 first responders. And sure enough, even though Oklahoma Senator Tom Coburn would not respond to one particular Fox show's question about what it is he has against 9-11 first responders, Mr. Coburn was with willing to explain himself to another Fox show, and it was a doozy. This bill hadn't even been through a committee. We haven't had the debate in our committee <clears throat> on this bill to know if it is the best thing to do. We haven't had the testimony to know whether. This is a bill that's been drawn up and forced through Congress at the end of the year. Senator Cudley Beard, Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, says the reason he is committing to block health care for 9-11 first responders is because the bill did not go through a committee, didn't have a hearing. Total bullpucky. <laughs> Senator Coburn, bull, capital P, pucky. The 9-11 first responders bill did go through committee. It did have a hearing. Senator Coburn, you are on the committee that held the hearings on it. And you did not bother to show up for the hearing. Here, I present to you, is June 29th in the United States Senate, the hearing at which the 9-11 first responders bill was discussed. The hearing that Tom Coburn says did not happen, and because he says this hearing didn't happen, he says he's going to block 9-11 first responders' health care. You want to see Tom Coburn's chair during the hearing on the 9-11 first responders' bill? His chair during that bill is empty, because Tom Coburn did not bother to show up at that hearing. We confirmed this with the committee itself this afternoon. The hearing happened, Tom Coburn did not show up. Now he says, oh, if they'd only held a hearing. <laughs> if you've been wondering what the substantive argument is against funding health care for 9-11 first responders, you are not alone. Keep wondering. It is paid for. It is not on the deficit. It has been in the works in Congress for more than a year. The only reason it's being jammed right now at the end of the year is because Republicans have been delaying it all year long. It has been on the books for more than a year. It is 9-11 first freaking responders, but Republicans are still dug in against it. What does that tell us about Republican strategy, Republican leadership for this new Congress for this next two years? Joining us now is one of my favorite guests, Nicole Wallace, former communications director for President George W. Bush, former senior advisor to the McCain-Palin campaign, a very nice person and author of the novel 18 Acres. Nicole, thank you for crossing the ideological divide. My mom is out there. <laughs> That's the big secret. Your mom secretly is. That's the deal. All right, so tell me, when you look at Tom Coburn's behavior here, that there is some rational explanation, something greater at work here that I just don't understand. In the secret Republican strategy box? Yes. Please tell me. <laughs> well, there isn't. But he, look, the problem is, is bigger. Tom Coburn is someone that I think even the Obama team finds a constructive senator. And so... Senator Obama and Senator Coburn worked on a lot of right. things together so, in the Senate. So I don't want to single him out. But, but the entire Senate, minus the two New York senators, I think think has 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 carried some of the blame here when did 9-11 become New York's responsibility I mean I remember after 9-11 that was an attack right that was an attack on the whole country and and on September 12th and 13th and 14th 9-11 was always something we experienced as Americans not as New Yorkers not as residents of Manhattan so I'm appalled by Republicans and Democrats who don't stand next to Senator Schumer and Gillibrand and fight for the first responders because they weren't running into the buildings to save New Yorkers. They were running in the buildings to save America. But Republicans are filibustering. And, and this is, I, 
Yeah, this is a bigger question for me. That right, if it if it was up for an up or down vote, it would pass handily. Uh, even if it only passed with Democratic votes, it would pass handily. And Republicans are filibustering it. And what we've seen is the filibuster of everything now. And so all of these things that pass with overwhelming numbers, even Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal, passes with 65 votes. Right, all huge these numbers. Great bipartisan accomplishments. But why filibuster it? To why filibuster when it's going to get that many votes? And I don't know. Because I mean, delay. <laughs> <laughs> because passing nothing is better than passing something you agree with? Look, I, why, do, why do senators do what they do? I don't know, but I think that the Obama White House ends the year with some of its most popular and powerful accomplishments being the bipartisan ones. I mean, he had a very difficult first two years, but he's had a triumphant last eight weeks. And, and some of the power of what he's doing in these final weeks of the year is that he has bipartisan support. And, and I know there's a lot of consternation about the tax cuts being extended to all brackets. But the truth is, that gives this president a, a, a chance for independents to take another look at him. The bipartisan support for Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You know, I'm proud of the members of my party that supported that. I think if you tried to explain how that ever became the law of the land to someone who's in college, they'd look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. You know, that was, that was Clinton era policy, but it hardly makes sense right now. And, and you know, we have future generations to thank for making these things easier. You know, I think I think we see the Congress really lagging behind the times on some of these issues. But Obama is ending the year in a much stronger position than he started it. So, but uh, as Despite every... Despite the filibustering going on in the and, well, and the only reason that things are happening now is because finally Democrats have some leverage against the filibuster. They're saying, we won't let you go home. That's the only leverage that they've got. Now Republicans want to go and home. We know and they, they, they all they love all to, go like home. to go home. We all like Democrats to go home. Democrats like to go home. I'm going home right now inside my head. <laughs> That's the way it works. But the uh, as every Tom, Dick, and Haley starts running for president, right? <laughs> oh, Any second now. Oh, we're not um, gonna go there. <laughs> I spent all day working on that. You want to know why we have a staff of 5,000 that works on this show? It's because it took 4,000 of them to come up with that line. <laughs> with everybody starting to run for president right now, what you just described, that President Obama's strongest accomplishments at the end here, especially in this lame duck, are one for which he got Republican votes. What's the Republican strategic calculation there? Because President Obama is the one ultimately who gets credit for the START treaty passing because it was such a priority right. of his. So do Republicans come under even increasing pressure to not do anything that even they might agree with if the political capital from it redounds to Mr. Obama? I think you're going to see two Republican parties. You'll see, you know, there are uh, senators in both parties who, who go there to govern. Coburn's one of them. Yeah. Lindsey Graham is one of them. And, and McCain hopefully will be one of them now that, that his presidential aspirations are behind him. On alternate two um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Yeah. Uh, but, but, but you'll see the pack that'll be running for president and they'll be real focused on taking apart, repealing parts of Obamacare. I don't think that they'll be well served to do it in a general capacity. I think Republicans will be best served by being specific and technical, but not by being, demo, you know, engaging in, in, in the theatrics and- Calling it Obamacare. Right, I think, I think, I think <laughs> well, I think if they are specific yeah. and technical and legal, I think if Republicans build some alliances, alliances with state's attorneys to, they make me nervous. I, I know. That's the idea. <laughs> They're on my heaviest. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. That, I mean, yay 92nd Street, why? I mean, I love this place. You think they go small bore on health care? My God. I think the last time I was in a room this big, I walked Sarah Palin onto the stage at the <laughs> Republican convention, and we know how that ended. No wonder you're um, shocked. Yeah. And so, um, what was I saying? You were saying that no, Republicans need to go small bore on health care. Right, so the health care, trying to undo things, I think makes people anxious. So I think to the extent that Republicans want to discuss repealing the health care reform, they'd be best served by doing it in a technical and legal capacity and being extremely specific and working with the state's attorneys general who are going to be the ones who bring the lawsuits that will right. ultimately end up in the Supreme Court. Nicole, I agree with you on like 4%. You are about 100% of politics. I, you're a real good sport. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for coming on.
Nicole Wallace is former communications director for President George W. Bush, former senior advisor from the McCain Palin campaign, which scarred her greatly. greatly. Uh, her new novel is called 18 Acres, and I, um, I very highly recommend it. All right, tonight on our special show edition of The Interview, just because I wanted to bookend Nicole Wallace and Michael Moore, it's Michael Moore right here next. We're here at the 90 Seconds Street Live. Please stay with us.